Okay, welcome to the seventh in our series of the Origin and Evolution of the Moon Academic Level Graduate Course, brought to you by the Solar System Exploration uh, Research Virtual Institute. Um, we're really happy to have with us today Dr. Clive Neal, who will talk to us on the Highlands Rock Suite, Clues to Early Lunar Evolution. Let me say a few words about Clive. Clive, I could say many, many words about Clive. Love to because we have a lot of stories going back for a while, but I'll spare you most of those. Uh, Clive is currently a professor of geological science sciences at the University of Notre Dame, and he's also the former chair of NASA's Lunar Exploration Analysis Group League, known to all of us. And during his time as league chair, he really uh, uh, did an exceptional job in overseeing the development of the lunar exploration roadmap that involves three things: science of, from, and on the moon feed forward to other destinations, and making the next era of human exploration sustainable. And of course, with the recent um, National Space Directive number one, which sent humans back to the moon to return, to um, in fact, uh, explore the surface of the moon with astronauts and robotic exploration. Um, in fact, this is the prime time to call on that wonderful lunar exploration roadmap uh, to help us pave the way for um, scientific and commercial uh, partnerships. So, Clive received his um, BS in geology at the Luna University of Le Leicester in the United Kingdom in 1982, uh, and PhD at the University of Leeds, also in the UK in 1986. And he did a postdoctoral research associate uh, position at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville in 1986 to 90, working with the famed Larry Taylor. Uh, that's where I first encountered, I think, uh, Clive. Um, and he's been an, a professor at Notre Dame since 1990 up to the present. And he also has um, published over 80 papers. Um, this may be out of date. I'm sure it's over 100 by now. In refereed journals and co-edited two books. And uh, as it says in his bio, when not focusing on the moon, he is involved with scientific ocean drilling program. This is another life that Clive leads. And trying to keep up with his Australian wife, three children, and six grandchildren, which also may be out of date. He can bring us up to date on that. <laughs> <laughs> you slaggered you, Clive. Um, so, Clive, I, you know, I've known Clive for many years, and he, we can all really uh, owe Clive a great debt of gratitude for all the things he has uh, graciously done, um, against all odds in some cases, to further lunar science uh, in, uh, in our discipline and also with national and international space agencies. Uh, so he's he's just done an exceptional job there, and, and his travel has taken him all over the planet uh, to, in fact, ensure that. Um, so today, um, I'd like to, together with David Kring of the LPI, uh, the uh, co-organizer of the course, welcome uh, Clive Neal. And let me just, before you come on, Clive, let me make sure from Ricky, we've got a uh, setup with the slides over. Yeah, we've got the slides. Okay, Clive, over to you. How many grandchildren is it now? It is nine grandchildren now and uh, 120 something papers. I, I can't remember. Okay. So uh, it's, it's uh, so, something like that. I'm talking about the number of grandkids, not the number of papers. So uh, um, thank you very much for the invite. And despite some technical difficulties, I am actually joining you from a variety of different communication devices. So um, I'm going to talk today about the Lunar Highlands Suite, it's something that we've been working on for about four or five years now. Um, and the title was to be Clues to Early Lunar Evolution, but I put a question mark after that because as we go through, as, as our investigations have gone through and looked at the uh, Lunar, uh, Lunar Highlands Suite, uh, we come up with uh, some intriguing results that I'm going to present today. And I, I got a I've included Mike Tassivia uh, as a co-author of this one because basically he's done all the work and uh, he's uh, hopefully going to have something which in the not too distant future that will show the approach that we've taken and some of the limitations of using the return of Verona Northazites and Highland Magnesium sweet samples to actually get ages and try and uh, look at the chronology of the early lunar crust. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Okay. There we go. So uh, 
Yes, thank you, thank you to the uh, to Elrock. Uh, we have uh, some high resolution imagery now, and you can see our moon, which I'm sure is of um, sure is familiar to everybody online. But what it shows is the is the dichotomy between the near side and the far side with regards to the basins uh, the Mari filled basins on the near side and the almost lack of such uh, Mari filled basins on the far side due to the thicker crust um, that is uh, that is facing away from us and the thinner crust on the near side and that's going to become an issue I think um, uh, that we need to address so uh, if we go to the next slide uh, we can see that we've got uh, just homing in on the on the near side now you can see press the next slide that we've got the uh, Mari filled basins and the next slide Well, there is a time lag. All right, press it again, just for giggles and grins. And uh, we can see that we've got our highlands regions. We can go out and just look up without any uh, any aids. There should be another one coming up. And uh, you've got the impact craters that have subsequently impacted into the crust and the Maria. Uh, some of the early impactors, the basin forming impactors, were flooded with the Mari basalt. So these happened in the lunar evolution. Um, but we've got the whiter areas of the highlands being uh, ostensibly dominated by plagioclase and the uh, basalts being usually plagioclase undersaturated, so dominated by the more darker ferromagnesium minerals. And it gives you a nice uh, indication of the different terrains uh, that, uh, that we can see. And we're focusing primarily on the highlands, if you go to the next slide. So if we, we look at the samples that, uh, that have been returned, we, we've had six Apollo and three robotic lunar sample return missions uh, from the moon. Uh, we can see that uh, only Apollo 16 um, in, in the uh, center right there actually came from a, a highlands region. Um, maybe the uh, uh, Luna 20, it looks like Luna 24 is wrong, but that's okay. Luna 20 was also from the Highlands, but they recovered less than a hundred grams, I believe. Um, so uh, the Apollo 16 is is our is our database of uh, samples from from a Highlands region. And although we have uh, feldspathic lunar meteorites, uh, the you know, we know they come from the Moon, but where on the Moon is still a question for debate. So if you go to the next slide, soon after the return of the early Oh, the first Apollo samples, Apollo 11, you start to see that uh, an, an idea of, of these basalts being derived from a process source came about. And you can see uh, in the middle of the diagram there, there's the uh, rare earth element profiles with the, uh, with the basalt, uh, basaltic uh, materials having a negative europium anomaly. Now, these uh, are undersaturated in plagioclase. So it has not happened during uh, the evolution of that given melt. It must have been inherited from the source region. Given that the, uh, uh, the, the highlands materials are rich in feldspar, the idea of the lunar magma ocean is that we had a flotation of a plagioclase rich crust uh, that depleted the, uh, the ferromagnesium minerals that were also crystallizing in europium and uh, they sank into the lunar mantle to form the source regions for the Mari basalts. So we got this very nice uh, um, model to explain the observations, at least we've seen from, um, from, the return, uh, from the first return samples, and subsequently this was shown from the, uh, from the lunar and the rest of the Apollo missions. Go to the next slide. So in terms of uh, islands, Trust. We've been dealing with three basic suites and various divisions therein. But uh, we're looking at the uh, Ferroan and Orthocytes. If you look at the diagram on the left, we've got the Ferroan and Orthocytes forming a vertical trend here, where we're plotting the uh, um, mole percent and orthite and plagioclase against the magnesium number and the, mafic, and the associated mafic minerals. And then we have uh, uh, a somewhat uh, positive trend between the magnesium suite to the alkali suite. Um, you know, Odette James, back in the uh, late 80s, started to 
find subdivisions of these different Faroe and anorthosites. But again, they are, they are adhering to this vertical trend on the, uh, on the diagram there. And to give you a sense of what we're looking at, it, it's often good to actually look at the rocks you're analyzing. So uh, you can see we've got 15415 and 60025 uh, uh, hand specimens uh, that uh, give us an idea of the, of the pleasure plays rich in nature of these highland rocks. Go to the next slide, please. So there's been various modeling that's been done, and one of the uh, one of the most fundamental references I did not add here was the Taylor and Yakis 1974 in the proceedings of the of the fifth lunar and uh, lunar science conference um, that also that looked at this idea of modeling uh, an initially molten magma ocean, whether it be the top 500 or the top thousand or whole moon melting. Um, that uh, that affected the moon, and we could see that the modeling shows that it's about 78 to 80 percent crystallization is required, depending upon what your uh, your bulk AL203 is, uh, before plagioclase starts to form. So you can see in the diagram on the left, the initial crust of the moon was actually a quench crust, and in terms of the samples that have been returned either by uh, robotic and human missions or by lunar meteorites, we have no um, no representation in our sample suite of this quench crust. So this uh, leads to a bit of a conundrum, because how long did the magma ocean take to crystallize comes into play, and how did all this plagioclase actually get to uh, the surface and, and give us the the what we see today when we go outside and look up uh, at the moon? So yes, we've got plagioclase that comes out, but it comes out late. So that means that we've got an awful lot of material in the lunar mantle that has no negative europium anomaly. Uh, in all the Mari basalts that we have and we've analyzed, we have this ubiquitous negative europium anomaly. So it led to the, an evolution of the magma ocean model in terms of accumulate overturn. And we have the oxide minerals, as you can see there, and these uh, schematics. Uh, they come out last, it's ilmenite, it's dense, and it causes uh, instability and an overturning and mixing of the cumulate pile that, uh, <clears throat> that then mixes late with early, late stage cumulates with early ones, and you end up with an overall negative europium anomaly, uh, the magnitude of which depends upon how much of the late cumulates you actually have. So we've got a couple of things that start to stand out, late crystallization of plagioclase, and what happened to that quenched crust? Obviously, it's gone. Um, and if you look at the surface of the moon, you can see how heavily bombarded it's been. And it may have been bombarded to oblivion uh, so that we only see the underlying uh, plagioclase highlands crust that is now there. So the, even then, the highlands crust may be a secondary crust uh, from that initial quenched crust. Go to the next slide, please. The other thing that's uh, intriguing is this idea of the vertical trend on the uh, mole percent anorthite in plagioclase versus the magnesium number in the, in the mafic minerals. Um, and Hannah McVassell um, and co-authors 2015 suggested that this was due to somewhat uh, uh, deep crystallization uh, within the magma ocean that could uh, um, that, that could actually give a, a, a negative azeotropic uh, configuration. You can see in the bottom right diagram there what we're talking about in terms of having that, uh, that negative, uh, negative azeotropic configuration where we can actually uh, buffer the anorthite content of our crystallizing plagioclase uh, due to the, the, the fact of this the configuration in the phase diagram that you see there. The other important thing here is that we also get an excess of uh, aluminous phases. And in this, in this phase diagram, it's called uh, corundum. Um, but we're now starting to see other aluminous phases from the, uh, from the N-cube data on Chandrayaan-1. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. Oh. Yeah, we can see that we've got rock types are being, now being described from orbit that are not actually represented in the sample collection. And uh, Carly Peters, in a couple of papers here, and the co-authors from the M-Cube mission, 
or MQ instrument uh, pointed out that we have these olivine OPX and MG spinel rich lithologies. Uh, that if you uh, next slide. Uh, so this could be due to uh, actually being a direct product of the LMO. You saw the, the corundum that was coming out. This could also be a spinel phase. It could be an impact melt cumulant, or it could be um, mag magma wall rock interaction as the MG sweet magmas came through this north acidic wall rock and precipitated the uh, uh, the spinel phases. And I gave give a couple of references there or references there. So. Uh, uh, where these uh, different models have been proposed. Go to the next slide, please. So Highland samples, then we've got three basic units. We've got our Ferrona North Acidic Suite, fan, or FAS or FAN, um, and considered this is considered, uh, these rocks are considered to be the primary crust formed by plagioclase flotation in the LMO, uh, because we certainly don't have any samples of the quench crust. Next slide. Uh, Highland's Magnesium Suite, or the HMS. So these uh, formed through secondary melting of the cumulate mantle and were intruded into the already formed furrow and anorthosites. And then next slide, we have our Highlands alkali suite, uh, potentially evolved M member of the Highlands magnesium suite. Um, it's been modeled by uh, Chevet and McGee 1999. And this is where we find our quartz monzo gabbros, quartz monzo diorites, granites, etc. And they form the, the most evolved M member of that uh, of that um, that trend, that positive trend on the northite versus magnesium number plot. Go to the next slide, please. So we've got our inference then that our Ferrona northosite sweet rocks should be older than the Highlands magnesium sweet and also the alkaline sweet. So if we look at the samarium neodymium uh, chronometer, which seems to be the most robust, um, although it has been suggested that you need to use multiple cr chronometers uh, that give the same age to be the best approach, and Lars Borg has demonstrated that in his 2011 Nature paper. Um, uh, next slide. But we have issues when we look at the actual dates of uh, the ages of the uh, uh, fan sample, fast samples that have actually been analyzed. You can see in the diagram on the right there, we've just got a um, an age and we've just sort of staggered them, youngest going to the bottom left, oldest going to the top right. Um, and you can see that they cover quite a substantial age range. And there's also some rather considerable uncertainties associated with some of these ages. So we've got a, a I've got a number of issues there is how do you keep a, a magma ocean uh, that is uh, liquid for that long, active for that long, that is still forming. Now, remember, as we're forming the uh, Ferroan and orthocytes, it's only the last uh, 20 to 22 percent of the magma ocean that we're talking about. So it's not the whole magma ocean as such. It's the it's the only the last quarter. If, if we're being generous there, uh, that is uh, crystallizing over 200 million plus uh, years. The other issue is that if we look at the work that's been done on 60025, it has two very distinct uh, uh, Sumerian neodymium ages. And you can see that in the diagram there. Uh, with uh, um, They are not within error. So next slide. So one one way to try and get around this, uh, Lindy Elkins Tanton at L uh, 2011 and Meyer at L 2010 looked at um, having a uh, uh, an insulating lid on the magma ocean coupled with uh, the effects of tidal heating, and they their modelling suggested, uh, given the proximity of uh, the moon to Earth at this time, much closer than it is now. Uh, that the, could keep the magma ocean alive for about 220 million years. Now, that's fine when we uh, look at that age range, but remember, that age range, according to our modeling, in terms of forming uh, or crystallizing the lunar magma ocean, the crust only formed in the last quarter of uh, the, the magma ocean as it crystallized out. So we have another issue there in terms of explaining the ages in terms of the process. If you go to the next slide, please. 
So looking at the highly magnesium sweet samples, we can see now we've got, I'm getting a weird echo. So, all right. You're, well, coming, to, you're coming across okay here, Clive, over. Yeah, I'm hearing myself as well, and it's really off-putting. Oh, yeah, I must be putting you lot to sleep. Um, but okay. So what we see here then, we've got uh, the archetypal uh, MG suite sample 76535. Uh, you, you, but you can see the ages, uh, severe and neodymium ages for that, uh, for, the, uh, for the magnesium suite samples. And you can see they are also spanning quite a large uh, age range. Go to the next slide. When we combine the pharoid and orthocyte with the Highlands magnesium sweet ages, we can see a number of things that give us causes for concern. We've got large uncertainties in, uh, in the determinations of some of these ages, both for pharoid and orthocytes and also the Highlands magnesium sweet. Uh, we also have several examples where we get different ages for the same sample. They may be overlapping in error bars in some cases, but we, what we're seeing here is, is that you've got a given sample that is supposed to be a pristine a, a Highlands Magnesium Suite or Ferona Northside Suite sample, and they give us two distinct ages. And the last one, one, one more time, press it again. Uh, you can see we've got overlapping Ferona Northside and Highlands Magnesium Suite ages. Change slide, please. So with those overlapping ages, is it frozen? With those overlapping ages, as you can see there, uh, remember that the ferron and orthocytes are supposed to be the crust to which the Highland Magnesium Suite was intruded. Uh, but now we're seeing contemporaneous formation. You've already changed the slide, good. Um, you can also see with the uh, Highlands Alkali Suite, and I've used a compilation of uranium lead zircon ages for these samples. You can see again that these also overlap with the Magnesium Suite and Ferron and Orthozyte Suites. So we were talking about all three suites forming contemporaneously, and uh, not in our nice little compartmentalized model that we had to begin with with regards to the primary crust being the ferroin and orthocytic crust and the other two suites uh, being intruded into it. Um, this is, uh, for the, highland, for the highland, uh, Highlands Alkali suite ages, this is not a complete data set. Um, I didn't have time to go through, but I pulled out the ones that have been compiled by Greg Snyder. And uh, as you can see there, there's quite a few ages that come out, but they do tend to overlap. Overall, they're slightly younger um, than the Ferroin and North sites, but they do overlap with them once again. So uh, if I can yeah. uh, paraphrase, Houston, we have a problem. Um, how many slides are you up ahead there? You're, you're too far ahead. Go back one. It, it's, uh, okay, right now it's FAS Mineral Chemistry, and now it's back to Highland Magnesium Sweet Samples. It's a mess. No, you are, you are, too, yeah, back one more. It's now fair in a north uh, site sweet samples with a, a lot of thin sections. Over. Okay. Well, that's not what I'm seeing. So that's uh, fine. All right. Uh, we'll go blind. Uh, all right. Why does the uh, why does the why does the Ames uh, server hate me? That's why I don't, don't understand. <laughs> it's the accent, Clive. <laughs> or lack thereof, James. <laughs> Touche. All right. So I'm assuming you're looking at Ferroin and Orthocyte suite um, and samples. That's the one that it says, because that's not what I'm seeing on my end. That's um, what we're seeing here. Is, okay. So you can see these are heavily brecciated and mixed. And uh, James in 1991 with 60025 actually pointed out that this, uh, this sample appeared to be of mixed lithologies. Now these, all these kind of micrographs are from those fast samples that have had uh, samarium neodymium ages um, determined for them. The four on the left are all from 60025. 
Um, heavily brecciated, maybe recrystallized, mixed. Uh, so what are we actually age dating when we start to uh, create isochron ages? Go to the next slide. If we look at the, um, if we look at the magnesium sweet samples, I take it it's changed. Uh, we see the highly magnesium sweet samples. We've got uh, norites. But if we look at 76535, we have a beautiful metamorphic equilibrated texture uh, for 76535. And again, 72215 on the left, we are seeing that just starting to uh, to be re with the um, 120 degree triple junctions, much uh, much finer. Uh, brain size than 76535, but uh, there's some things happening to these samples that do not appear to be primary ignis, and it's happened in the subsolidus. Uh, go to the next slide. So the approach that we've taken with the ferroin and orthocytes um, is to examine the mineral chemistry in uh, five sections now. Um, and we look at the individual phases. Uh, both with uh, majors and traces uh, using laser ablation, ICPMS, calculate equilibrium liquids, and then we compare with the lunar magma ocean uh, trace element, lunar magma ocean evolution models to see whether or not the liquids from which these different phases crystallized are consistent with what we understand to be the evolution of the lunar magma ocean. Next slide. However, there's always a, a however. Um, you know, care is needed in identifying really re-equilibration signatures. Subsolidus re-equilibration has, uh, has affected these. Again, this is uh, that James has also pointed out that uh, um, the, the peroxine uh, in 60025 and other peron and orthocytes has undergone um, uh, ex solution, and they, uh, it's concluded that it was an, was it initially an inverted pigeonite. But now we're seeing OPX and we're seeing uh, high calcium pyroxenes. And then we can see diffusion of elements from plagioclase and pyroxene into associated olivine, which is also present in these rocks. And that has been documented uh, in terrestrial samples, uh, a recent paper by Stead et al. Chemical Geology is an important one to look at for that. So we have to be careful in, okay, we can calculate an equilibrium liquid, but are we actually using a signature that was that has been un, uh, unmolested, if you like, for the last uh, four and a half billion years, uh, in order to see the liquid that it came from. Go to the next slide, please. So what we're seeing here, just focusing on six double o two five, we have uh, the plagioclases from fourth in sections there. Uh, pretty unremarkable. Uh, we've stopped it at uh, holmium there because. In ferroin and orthocytes, we get down pretty much to the detection limit and they get very spiky. You can see that in 60025269 in the top right there, uh, where, the, uh, where the heavies are down uh, less than uh, one times chondrite levels. There. But typical sort of plagioclase looking uh, rare earth profiles, nice positive europium anomaly uh, with a slight reliable earth enrichment. Go to the next file. We now look at the, the pyroxenes from these uh, these thin sections, and you can see down at the bottom two in uh, 60025, 273, and 274, the highest ones represent um, high calcium uh, orgites, ferroorgites from uh, from 60025. Um, the others are the low calcium uh, pyroxenes from that. But what I want you to point out here is in the bottom bottom left. And in the bottom right, you'll see a couple of um, pyroxenes with a positive europium anomaly. Not a negative, as in all the other ones, but a positive europium anomaly. So originally, we thought that this was due to the fact the laser had clipped a little bit of uh, pyroxene. Um, and so went back and looked at the strontium uh, throughout the analysis and checked on that signal because it should be much higher in the peroxy. The strontium in these positive uh, europium and non peroxines is no different from any of the other low calcium peroxines that were analyzed. Uh, we don't we believe that this is an actual signature within the uh, the peroxine itself. 
And it could be due to real equilibration with plagioclase, but somehow doubt it. This is uh, something that uh, looks in, entirely sort of impact generated, um, or it could be a, a disequilibrium uh, signature within the peroxy. Go to the next slide, please. So we have to then go a little bit further to look at are these um, equilibrated or pristine uh, signatures that we've actually measured from these different phases. So we're looking at, at plagioclase, clonoproxene, and orthoproxene partition coefficients. Uh, we get to calculate those for 60025, and we'll compare those to the rest of the model data. Uh, you can see there we've compared that with experiments as well as terrestrial basalts and a crude basalt, um, and uh, some from uh, from the uh, the uh, uh, from the site suite from James et al. Um, so the diagrams on the on the right actually show the results. So we've got the rare earths and we've got the uh, partition coefficient of plagioclase over the partition coefficient of OPX. Uh, the gray dots represent the experimental rates from Graf et al. Uh, in that uh, top uh, diagram there. And the other symbols represent uh, either the uh, 0025 data or the uh, uh, equilibrated data from, or the equilibrium data from uh, the other natural examples. And you can see, for the most part, we've got uh, the 0025 is plotting at the bottom end or the lower temperature end of the uh, of the experimental range uh, for uh, for the agiclase and OPX. Uh, if you look at the bottom one here, you can see that the uh, the high calcium, and we only had a couple of examples there. The high calcium is is out of equilibrium. It is is something that we can't use. Uh, we've got plagioclase over CPX here, and we see that the um, the high calcium data plot below the uh, the the uh, natural samples that we've also included here. Next slide. And what we've got. Is the fact that we can use our plagioclase and, and some of the orthoperoxies appear unaffected by the subsolidus equilibration in 60025, and, and these are the crystals that we need to look at in terms of calculating equilibrium liquids if they actually came from the magma ocean. Next slide. So, how do we calculate equilibrium liquid compositions? Uh, starting with plagioclase, this is uh, work done by Blundy and Wood uh, back in the in the 90s and, and early thousands, and uh, it's been modified by Virgil uh, uh, Bois. I think that's how you say his last name. And but, uh, he he's uh, put this together and used experimental data. I'm getting that echo again, and uh, we're using this experimental data to calculate. Uh, the coefficients A and D in that equation there from the regressions you can see for scurium uh, on the diagram to the right. Um, and you can, you can then calculate for, and uh, you can then calculate your partition coefficient for scurium for the given anorthite content in your plagioclase. Uh, so again, this is something that, that uh, uh, allows us then to get a much more accurate idea of partition coefficient. For every analysis we've done, we have a unique partition coefficient based upon the actual composition at that point in the crystal. So we've calculated our coefficients at about 1,000. As we saw in the previous diagram, when we're trying to look at equilibration, uh, we can see that uh, on the plagioclase OPX, we fall at, uh, at just below the 1,100 uh, data point. And uh, that's why we're using a thousand here. But for europium, um, we have to be a little bit sneaky. We have to use experimental data that uh, was conducted at or below the iron wolf type buffer uh, for, uh, in terms of oxygen fugacity. So we can actually understand how europium 2 plus is reacting. Next slide, please. So for peroxine, it gets a little bit more involved. Do we use uh, calculate partition coefficient using the lattice frame model? Um, Trying to go through these two papers that are cited here is a, is a talk in itself. Uh, that's why I've given you the references. 
and uh, it again it is basically using the uh, major element composition to calculate a a partition coefficient unique to the composition that we've actually derived from the electron microprobe. Go to the next slide, please. So europium, just hopping in a bit more about europium, uh, we can see we've got the 0025 data paired with experimental data from McKay et al. 1989. I assume that the, the uh, slide is changed. We should be seeing europium now. That's it. Okay, good. All right. So uh, here we're looking at the europium gadolinium uh, ratio of plagioclase over that in hypoxia. So using the, uh, the examination we've done earlier, we use OPX. And you can see here that we've got uh, in that diagram, 6 21 is uh, not in equilibrium with what we expect for the iron uh, Log FO2 of uh, iron, iron wustite. Uh, the other ones are, are plotting in and around the uh, the experimental data, but uh, there's something something looking a bit fishy with that uh, uh, 0025-21 data. So we would not be using those data uh, to calculate our equilibrium liquids to examine them uh, with the uh, uh, with the magma ocean. Okay, next slide, please. So looking at the uh, evolution model, see here where you're looking at the rare earth elements again, and using the Snyder at our 1992 starting composition, uh, we then go through the different phases with PCS being percent, uh, uh, PCS percent crystallized solid. Um, and you can see we get very creep-like materials as we get uh, further along in the, uh, in the evolution there. And the red triangles, uh, high K creep from Warren 1989. Um, and we've also included a bit of garnet, it's like garnet and it's just my model, and I'm allowed to do it. So uh, put that in there to, to show that you can, you can actually crystallize a little bit of garnet in the magma ocean, uh, assuming that it's deep enough. Um, that does not dramatically change your outcome. If you go above three percent, then we start to see some distinct changes from our models. But uh, up to three percent is certainly possible. But you see the development of the negative europium anomaly uh, as soon as plagioclase uh, comes on the liquidus. Next, next slide, please. So using these data then, we're just plotting lanthanum versus neodymium for the different uh, uh, LMO models that we model. Uh, we've got the, the no garnet uh, model here, just to, just to show. And what we've done is, is take the data from the ferron and all the references down uh, below. And you can see the high case group up at the uh, top here. Somebody must have their microphone open. Um, we've got the uh, got the high K creep when we're at the end of uh, the magma ocean crystallization or closely. And then the arrows down here represent where the magic phase comes on the liquidus. And you can see the spread of data from these different ferron and orthocytes are plotting exactly where they should be, apart from the the creepy ones uh, at the top of the right. So it, it appears as if, at least in, in the test data from literature data, this is working uh, better than better than expected, shall we say. Um, so if we go to the right-hand slide, we can see we've got our 60025 data now superimposed with the cross, red crosses representing plagioclase and the blue diamonds representing uh, the pyroxenes that we've uh, looked at. And we can see here that, yes, there are some that fall on the predicted trend, but a lot of the peroxines are falling off that trend, suggesting they've either undergone subsolidus for equilibration uh, or um, you know, they uh, didn't form uh, from the magma ocean. Go to the next slide, please. So now we're looking at the, uh, uh, the, the slope of the rare earth element profile, we're looking at lanthanum versus uh, erbium. And you can see there's more scatter here because we've got less fidelity in our uh, erbium 
experimental data. Um, but uh, you can see here again a lot of the the, uh, the data that plagioclase and the peroxines are plotting close to uh, that trend, but a lot of them are now falling off that trend. Uh, the, the, the highlighted ones down here at the bottom um, are the uh, three positive europium anomaly peroxines. Uh, next uh, slide, please. And there should be another one there that comes up and it circles the two high calcium peroxines uh, that we've, we've analyzed there. So uh, these these cannot be used in this model. They either didn't come from the uh, the magma ocean, or they're they're formed by other means um, or uh, through subsolidus equilibration. And those high calcium peroxine ones are probably uh, probably due to the fact that they've been exolved. Next slide, please. So did the corona north and south we actually crystallize into the magma ocean and and it. Some crystals definitely appear to have equilibrium liquids consistent with derivation from the magma. Others uh, appear not to do that. And you, I've highlighted these positive europium anomaly crystals again, uh, peroxines again. Uh, they could represent impact or other pristine pathology that have been thin. Next slide. The age states that are derived from these samples could therefore represent a line. We've got a variety of different pathologies. Be brought together as ratio that can now analyze. So we've got to be very careful in the uh, interpretation of these isochron agents. Uh, what exactly do they mean? Having these mixed lithologies could explain why we have some really dark in the ages um, or uncertainties on these ages that uh, that have been calculated using samarium neodymium, uh, the samarium neodymium chronometer. Next slide, please. So again, be careful with this. Uh, we've, we've got to now say, okay, we've we've got a we've looked at a thin section. What exactly are we age dating? So as always, being a sample guy, I, I think more samples certainly would hurt. Um, and we need to sort of get some samples from where most of the uh, North Acidic Highlands actually resides, which is the far side. Next slide, please. Right. We'll now be looking at a slide that says far side lunar crust. I'm assuming what's happening. Um, the uh, I don't connect happening somewhat slow. Um, so, M MG, if you look at the Agua emission data or Saline emission data from the Japanese. Uh, this is uh, Otaki et al. 2012 Nature paper, where they use the uh, saline data to look at the magnesium number, or at least derive the magnesium number, for near side highlands and far side highlands. Uh, you see the diagram on the far right, you see the Apollo 16 land site, uh, and it gives you the average magnesium number for that, about 61.5. If you look at the far side, they actually to a higher magnesium number, and they've suggested that magnesium anorthosite is on the far side, and that our thrown anorthosite are just unique to the uh, near side and maybe unique to the prosolarum creature. Uh, so we've we've got uh, some investigating to do there because magnesium anorthosite under the thrown we're going to have to rename it because <laughs> now we're mixing our sweets. So, uh, so it's, it's intriguing remote sensing data that can only be ground through with more samples, especially from the far side. And remember, our far side is much thicker, uh, much thicker crust than the, than the near side, um, and it, that's where the, the bulk of our of the lunar crust actually resides. And we certainly need to investigate that and and put that within the lunar magma ocean model. Next slide, please. So to summarize, um, we've got our uh, north site and higher magnesium between uh, rocks are complicated. They've been mixed, retiated, shocked, and equilibrated. Uh, we we can see that just by looking at this section. Next, next slide. The interpretation of uh, isochron agents is undertaken with thought. 
In fact, we've got to examine every crystal that we use to, look at to, to construct an isotope and only include those crystals that have LMO affinities as shown through equilibrium liquids uh, to, uh, to derive age. Next slide. Uh, samples of the uh, crust on the far side are desperately needed to ground through the saline observations. And uh, we need some. We need to show if some of the meteorites we actually looked at come from far side. Uh, they tend to be low in iron. Some of them do. And Julianne Gross's paper a couple of years ago showed that very nicely. So, so we think though that the lunar macro ocean hypothesis is holding up so far. Uh, we need to be much more strategic in how we construct that of some in order to understand if if these samples came from the magma ocean and how long that magma ocean was, uh, was liquid. Next slide, please. So uh, the campaign that I put it forward here is that we need to now look at the high magnesium species the same way we started to look at the Faroe uh, and the site. It's a crystal by crystal campaign and then only use those crystals Next slide, please. Uh, only use those crystals to uh, calculate the ages of, uh, of these samples. The ages that are giving us uh, the, the fits about our magma ocean hypothesis, if we carefully construct our, our, our isochron ages, that B is the test of the lunar magma ocean um, and, and does it apply to the fact that uh, the Highlands magma Sweet actually were derived from the magma ocean, or were they actually secondary melts that uh, that were then through to the Next slide, please. There any questions? Uh, go for the next slide, too, Ash. Okay, there we go. Okay, Clive, that was really excellent. So uh, this is Jim Head again, and uh, Ariel Deutsch has been uh, kept putting together the questions, and she's going to ask them here. And please feel free to give us your best shot. Over. Yeah. Hi, Clive. Our first question is about your crystallization models, and the question is, can you elaborate on the garnet that you use, and also the significance of including or excluding garnet? Garnet, what was I used? Something got muffled there. Gar what garnet will we use it? Yeah. Sorry, and, I, and your, what is the significance oh, of it? including or excluding garnet? Oh, um, significance of including garnet. Um, the reason we did that is on the basis of some work I did on looking, re examining the, the critic glasses. Some of those glasses do have a garnet signature in the trace element chemistry. Um, so what, uh, when we did the lunar magma ocean modeling, uh, what we wanted to do was use garnet to see how much we could include before we uh, increased the light rare earths over the heavies much more than we actually see with our creep samples. So the, the high K creep or ur creep uh, is supposedly light rare earth enriched. That has the uh, typical creep signature. So if you go above 3%, uh, and this is magnesium pyrope uh, going to iron pyrope, as you go through the crystallization, um, this, this is uh, you, you get about three percent. You tend you tend to have a, an over enrichment of the lights and the heavies, um, which is what we observe. So up to about three percent garnet in inclusion is permitted. Uh, we think that it it occurred uh, uh, that it's present in the source region of some of the picritic glasses. But uh, as we know, the picritic glasses and the Mari basalts are not genetically related. So that all has to be fitted into our, our magma ocean hypothesis. A few more questions about the LMO models. The Go first ahead. is, um, what is the predicted composition of the mantle after LMO, LMO formation? Uh, the, the, it's a derived, uh, you mean a bulk composition of the mantle. Uh, there is yeah. no mantle after the LMO is formed because it's liquid. And so basically you're, you're looking at the bulk composition of the lunar magma ocean. 
Um, if you look at the Elkins tent and that owl 2011, and the uh, she uses uh, John Longy's L pump as a bolt composition. Uh, Greg Snyder, Snyder et al. 1992, uh, we used a sort of a, a hybrid of the bolt compositions or the bolt moon compositions that was available, um, and it has a little higher uh, AL203 than L pump. I think about one way. I think um, so. We were we were trying again. I, I think part of the question was, uh, d does the does the residue for the lunar magma ocean does it make any difference if it's uh, an olivine rich metal or a uh, pyroxene rich or how does you know how does how do you um, uh, intuit anything about um, the nature of the metal from what we see in the North City crust? Well. Well, the nature of the mantle is what we see from the Mari basalts, and that goes back to the first diagram when you see that they have this ubiquitous negative European anomaly. So the idea of the magma ocean is to account for that by extraction of uh, plagioclase during the formation of the source. So uh, you, you look at the Mari basalts, this, they're, they're plagioclase undersaturated, uh, which means that you don't actually crystallize plagioclase from these magmas as they are sent to the surface. So you cannot generate that negative Europa anomaly through a one, pro, one stage process, i.e. melt it, well, two stages, melt it, or actually crystallize plagioclase and erupt it. Um, it's actually ubiquitous in the soil. So that's what we see from, from the, uh, the basalts. Uh, so that's what, why you have the, uh, the magma ocean hypothesis to explain your feldspathic rich highlands crust as well as your mantle source region showing this depletion in Europa. That's great. So uh, one thing, Clive, was I think people in previous classes we've talked a bit about uh, the the nature of the mantle and whether it is uh, you know the search for mantle material in the existing uh, mm -hmm. collections and whether you know whether we should be seeing significant quantities of olivine if, to identify it as a mantle rock or whether just uh, certain types of pyroxenes might be uh, without olivines might be what the mantle uh, might be characterized by. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that from your work on. The, the formation of the um, LMO. Over. I think I think that uh, we're trying to apply a. Can you go to slide seven? We're trying to apply a terrestrial model to the moon, um, and maybe that's not the best thing to do because the terrestrial mantle has been processed and processed and processed. Uh, if we believe uh, the moon um, after the overturn of the cumulate pile. There's not been much action other than a bit of melting here and there at, uh, from, the, from the lunar mantle. So if we go to slide seven, um, I don't see it coming up, but uh, you can see bulk of your mantle is going to be olivine and orthoperoxy. So more of a Hartsfordgitic composition. Um, so three quarters of it, over three quarters of it is going to be a Hartsfordgite. Uh, once you have that uh, mixing through cumulative overturn, still not. Is the slide up? I, I'm not seeing it. Yes, it is. Okay, good. All right. Um, so, so you can see what you would the bulk, what the bulk of the mantle should look like on the basis of this model. So, when you look at uh, uh, Carly Peters' work for the ooze, we, I talked about the spinel. Um, and if you go to slide nine, two slides down from uh, the one we were just looking at, uh, you can see that these olivine OPX uh, rich areas may be something to look at in terms of um, mantle material. Uh, but it depends if we have a, a rough piece of mantle, we would expect to see them, the outcrops be much bigger than what we're actually seeing. So they could be subsequent uh, cumulates uh, that, have, that have formed there rather than primary mantle ecology. But until we go get samples, we're really not going to know much ab um, about that. And I think that this is why the remote sensing data is now informing us so incredibly well of where we need to go to, uh, to actually ensure that we have a representative sample suite here on Earth so that we can study our moon. That brought a very wide smile from Carly Peters. <laughs> uh, you owe me, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next. 
Our next question is, where do you think the nearly pure anorthosite that's seen in the Oriental peak rings fit into the picture of LMO? Mm, interesting one. That is, that is interesting. Um, I don't know. I have to say that. Um, how you end up with these pure anorthosites when you know that the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the crystallization models, the, the magma is multiply saturated. That, uh, that is asking for some uh, post-crystallization differentiation again, and it could be that, that you're actually now seeing that flotation cumulate uh, being a little bit more efficient in some areas than others, but the pan is becoming ubiquitous. We're finding it everywhere. So now we know what to, what to look for, we're finding it. So I think that, uh, that we, we could have evidence here of a very efficient separation uh, flotation of that uh, of that um, uh, a northside crust, a north city crust, um, and that's what gives rise to these uh, these pure northside pan outcrops that we're seeing from orbit. We have a couple of questions about ages. The first is how large are the uncertainties on FAS magnesium sweet or alkali sweet age dates, um, specifically the person is interested in also potential sampling bias. Mm, all right. Well, let's go and look at which slide am I going to pick? I'm going to pick slide 15. <coughs> so what you see with the, we've got the Highlands Alkali Suite on the left and then the Ferroin and North Site and Highland Magnesium Suites on the right. And those error bars are uh, two sigma. Um, calculated on the basis of the uh, isochrons. And what your, what, the reason why you're seeing such a large error on, uh, on the ones on the left is that they're older ages. There's only one or two uh, samples that actually have error bars bigger than the size of the symbol. Uh, the ones on the right, I really think we're dealing with, uh, you know, these, these are mixed rocks. Um, so six, uh, six double two, three, six, six, seven, oh, seven, five, um, six, seven, two, one, five, uh, for the pheromone and orthocytes have large error bars. Uh, think back to the, uh, to the photomicrographs of those, uh, these are incredibly battered. If we look at six double oh, two, five here on, on the, on the right hand side, two distinct ages. So we're recording two, uh, Distinct events uh, with these different uh, different isochrons, um, and so what are those events? Is it a crystallization? Is it a remobilization? Uh, is it a mixture? Uh, so there's there's uh, there's lots of questions that come in there, and that's why I'm saying you you've got to separate your crystals, analyze your crystals, and then high grade the ones that look like they're coming from the LMO, from the ones that aren't coming from the lunar magma ocean, and use those. If you want to find the age of the sample as it crystallized from the magma ocean, those are the crystals you should look at to form your isochrome. Okay. Um, 50 to 60 impact basins on the moon. Is it possible mm -hmm. that the different anorthosite age ranges are just basin impact melts that reflect these different aged basins? Could well be. Could well be. I mean, it's uh, you've got to take into the fact that you you've got uh, impact uh, materials. If if the the positive European anomaly pyroxenes, the only way we could figure out it would happen is that you would have a plagioclase rich impact melt that uh, crystallized um, crystallized out a little bit of pyroxene. You have to have a uh, a, a pair of melt that does have a positive europium anomaly in order to generate a peroxine with a positive europium anomaly. Um, so we uh, we think we see in six double o two five evidence for that impact generation of at least some of the some of the peroxines there. So it, it could be that not only has it reset everything, but we've generated melt that have then has then crystallized, and those. You go after the peroxines to include in your Severa neodymium uh, isochron age because uh, that gives you nice spread in Severa neodymium uh, relative to, to plagioclase. So it, it could well be. 
as I say, I think we need to be a little bit more discriminatory in terms of what we're using in uh, constructing the uh, um, uh, the isochrons. A question about future exploration. Where would mm -hmm. you go to return samples to resolve the LMO crystallization time sequence? Interesting one. I'd go to the moon. I think, <laughs> um, I, I think far side. Um, I think we need to bring the far side into the picture because although we have meteorites, we don't know where they came from. And having samples from the far side would allow us then to, to at least semi ground through those, those feldspathic meteorites that don't look very far on. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's important to, to do that. Where on the far side? I really don't see that there's a, you know, one place is better than other. But anything from the far side will inform us. Um, because we don't have any samples that we know of right now. So I think that uh, we would also need to go somewhere else on the near side to see uh, maybe on the eastern limb of the highlands to see just how ubiquitous the Faroan signature actually is. Is it, is, is the, are the Faroan and orthosite sweet rocks the anomaly rather than the, uh, uh, than the actual uh, LMO derived product? So, Clive, if um, if we sent you to the moon and sent you to those Oriental peak rings and the, these large pure anorthosite contacts, what kinds of things would you look for to uh, uh, to in fact distinguish uh, their origin, et cetera? Just some, some good field geology. Over. Oh, yeah. Now I have to put my field geology hat on, which hasn't been worn in a few years. Um, I think I think what we got to got to look at is is the the structural setting. These have been uplifted from depth. Uh, we'd have to look at the uh, uh, the nature of the samples as they came off, uh, as as you looked at the hand specimens, in terms of their crystallinity. Um, be looking for brecciation and as well as vein features, melt veins going through those. Um, I think Jack Schmidt did a, did a sterling job in some of the Apollo 17 boulders when he started to to spot those uh, impact melt veins uh, running through some of these. So. I think you've got to look at that, and, and you want to avoid those when you're sampling to try and get an age to look at a magma ocean. I think we now know so much more than we did during Apollo. We can be much more strategic in our in our sampling. Uh, so we need to avoid areas that are, are melt rich uh, in terms of Oriental. I mean, obviously, Oriental has had the snot beaten out of it. Uh, so. You're bringing up material from depth, so we try and avoid those areas that look like they've, they've, they've undergone impact melting. Um, it would also be good to, to try and map out some of the faults that should be around there as well, um, if we had all the time in the world. But, um, but it would be intriguing to see whether or not we could trace some of the uh, impact melt features uh, to be injected along some of these faults. Um, and I think that that would be. A, Getting a sample of that would allow you then to age date the impact uh, much uh, much more precisely. That's great, and uh, so that, that's the end of the formal questions here, Clive. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, as one of the co-leads of the New Views of the Moon Two book, if you could say a few words about that for the audience, so that we can be anticipating that, of course, without demonizing me for my late chapter. Over. I would never demonize you, Jim, but you're right. You still owe me a chapter. So, uh, but um, we have, I think, out of 21 chapters, um, we've we've actually probably going to be down to 20 because Paul Spudis and Tony Lavoie were putting together the Cis Lunar Space chapter. Um, I've spoken with Tony about this. Paul did not send Tony a first draft. He said he was going to do it, and he did not do it before he passed. So. Um, we're we're trying we're debating how to handle that. Um, I think it's an important chapter to be written. Um, we need somebody to write it. Um, but other than that, we've got I think at last count we've got 14 chapters out to review. Um, I've got I think I've got the we're doing three reviews per chapter, and the first um, first chapter that has all three reviews back. Has just uh, has just occurred, and those reviews will be going back to the authors. One of the big things that we've actually 
um, one of the big hurdles we run into is the length of the chapter. So during the revisions, I, I said, well, make sure you get it complete, but there's going to be some hard uh, decisions that need to be made in order that we can keep this to one volume in the RIMG series. Um, so uh, that is something, the bridge that we have to cross. But this is actually going much better than New Views 1. And I think primarily because we have many more community members involved. If you, you, know, if, if you weren't involved in the initial, um, initial writing of the chapter, uh, you, I'm hoping that you will be involved in the reviewing of, uh, of, of some of these chapters. Uh, so we are, I'm hoping by the end of the year to have all chapters in and reviewed. Uh, that means then we then have to work on a number of things, uh, getting the revisions done, involving the uh, Mineralogical Society of America editorial folks a lot more. Um, I'm hoping by early 2020 that New Views of the Moon 2 will be completed. That's my hope. But it depends on uh, everybody turning their chapters in. I got it. Okay, so <laughs> th thank you, Clive. And um, I, I want to quickly review a couple of things. Uh, uh, we really appreciate your your uh, attendance here and I know there was a little bit of a stretch in terms of getting to the hotel and getting hooked up but everything worked really well so we really appreciate it. Oh, all right. I want to, to, to say a couple of words about the coming uh, events and then a little bit about the Moscow meeting last week and then I want to turn it over to Dave Kring for a couple of minutes to talk about uh, his uh, meteor crater field work and also the bombardment conference that took place uh, a couple of weeks ago. So next week, we'll have um, uh, uh, Lunar Mari Volcanism, the Emplacement of Secondary Crust, and I'll be delivering that. I'll be reading my chapter to everybody. <laughs> I'll listen then. <laughs> okay. Yeah, record it and get it transcribed. No, I'm just, it's on the way. Okay. So, um, and then very excitingly, as I mentioned to you before, on the November 7th, uh, we will have um, the NASA Administrator, uh, Jim Bridenstine, who will talk about Space Directive Number 1, to the moon to stay. So um, this will be really exciting, and I want to make one other announcement. Um, on the last day, okay, of our uh, class, which will be December 19th, future exploration of the moon, the road ahead, uh, Apollo 17 lunar module pilot uh, Jack Schmidt has agreed to talk and not only talk about his mission, but also to lead us into the future. You may remember the pictures of uh, the president signing space directive number one. Jack was very prominently uh, right there, brought a sample from NASA, and uh, and so we'll really hear it from um, someone who has been to the moon and also is very uh, involved in Space Directive Number One and our future exploration of the moon uh, to talk about where we're heading from here. So I'm really excited about that, and I think that'll be a, a lot of fun. So uh, I wanted to say a few words about the meeting in Moscow last week. So this is the ninth uh, Moscow Solar System Symposium. It derived out of our survey um, uh, uh, supported. Uh, 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 micro symposia that we've had previously. The next one will be Micro Symposium 60 in Houston just before the next LPSC. And I just wanted to point out that um, during that meeting, there was a lot of good discussion about the moon, uh, moon missions from a variety of different uh, countries. And on Friday, um, we actually had arranged uh, with Lev Zaloni, the um, vice president of the Russian Academy of Sciences and the just recently director of IKI, um, we'd arranged to have some cosmonauts come to talk about um, uh, human robotic exploration uh, on on Friday. Uh, unfortunately, due to the uh, the uh, launch vehicle uh, anomaly, um, obviously they became extremely busy um, in the review board, et cetera. Uh, so we're unable to attend on Friday. But the good news was, and the good news was that everybody was safe in the in the uh, launch anomaly. And Nick Hagen and his uh, Russian cosmonaut colleague uh, actually were amazingly. In good, sh in amazingly good shape um, at, at, at during their uh, very hard landing, seven Gs, I think. In any case, um, we did have a very successful meeting. We had a uh, hour and a half uh, panel discussion in Moscow at the institute um, uh, on human robotic interactions and future exploration of the moon. Uh, one of the things that we had wanted to do was to indeed have the, uh, a number of the young cosmonauts come and you know, engage them in our successes in Apollo and how we could interact with human robotic exploration. And they weren't able to attend, but four 
um, uh, individuals from Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, were able to attend, including uh, the new um, uh, associate director uh, of Roscosmos for Science and Technology. A really uh, great young person um, and a professor, and uh, got two strikes against him. He's a professor and uh, uh, and uh, 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 well, that's one right. That'll do it right there. But anyway, really uh, dedicated uh, a new person, and so we were very excited uh, to have a panel discussion with Oleg, uh, myself, uh, Mikhail Marov, Lev Zeloni, and Igor Petrofanov, and we talked a lot about how to engage um, human and robotic exploration. And I pointed out all our uh, uh, the things we're doing in um, also commercial exploration uh, from the U.S. side. So it was a really excellent discussion, and I think we're going to continue that next year at the tenth. Moscow um, Solar System Symposium, and for sure we're going to line up a series of uh, cosmonauts and hopefully some astronauts to um, uh, to come and have another discussion about this as well. It's a very successful meeting. If anybody wants any details, please um, please email me. So let me turn it over to Dave Kring, who uh, is the co-organizer of, of our course here, and David has been uh, very busy um, uh, at Meteor Crater and the conference. And David, can you uh, say a few words? Sure, Jim. Um, so I spent the last three weeks in Flagstaff with uh, several back-to-back -back, um, activities. As you said, we started off with the Bombardment Conference. Um, I, I would say that there are three um, main uh, takeaways from that meeting. Um, one point of discussion was whether we can co-add subsurface gravity signatures of impact craters with surface expressions of impact craters to update um, or modify size frequency distributions of impact craters. Um, that would have a tremendous impact on what we think hit the moon um, and uh, the, the, the fluence of objects that hit the moon. Uh, so I, I don't think that that issue was resolved at the meeting, but it certainly generated a lot of debate. Another issue that came up is uh, how reliable is the existing chronology of impact events on the moon. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the Argonne-Argonne system and how it's been used in the past. Um, I think there's a general consensus that uh, some of the ages are suspect. Um, I think that um, there was some advocacy that all Argonne-Argonne ages are suspect and Personally, I think that that is a very, very uh, large stretch and an unreasonable conclusion. Um, I think that one has to use the Argon-Argon data uh, with um, appropriate oversight, but I think it, it tells a very compelling story. The other thing that uh, struck me in listening to the conversation is that there's a lot of misunderstanding about impact creators and impact cratering processes. Um, and this, I have to say, is I think representing an evolution in uh, planetary geology and planetary sciences that we have to be mindful of if we are going back to the moon. Um, Jim, as you know, uh, because you were there, uh, the scientists supporting Apollo were geologists. Uh, they had tremendous, usually tremendous amounts of field experience. Um, and they applied that field experience to the planning and training uh, of operational scenarios on the lunar surface. Planetary sciences has evolved tremendously, uh, and thankfully so. Um, it's expanded to include um, uh, the, the evolution of, of planetary climate. Uh, it involves uh, icy surface bodies, um, and so on and so forth. But what that evolution has done is it has pushed the community away from the talents that are really needed for in situ lunar surface operations. So we need to recapture that talent um, or develop that talent anew. And I guess with that, uh, I would segue in then to the survey sponsored field training and research program at Media Creator, which is designed in part to do just that. Uh, we introduced uh, students to the uh, geology of a simple crater, uh, which all of the students soon realized is not so simple after all. 
Uh, they very successfully mapped traces of fallback breccia on the rim of Media Crater, uh, which uh, is not incorporated into Gene Shoemaker's map. So this is completely new research, a new finding um, that I think they found exciting and uh, is a type of finding that we will also want to use when we go back to the moon. Okay, thank you very much, David. And I think this will lead into the um, uh, talk on October 31st, which is Lunar Impact Cratering and Formation of Impact Basins. And this is gonna be co-led by um, uh, Gordon Osensky, Oz, as he's known, and University of Western Ontario, and Brandon Johnson here at Brown. And as you know, that's a really complimentary aspect along the lines of what um, David Kring was just talking about, which is we're looking at uh, ISAIL modeling and a really understanding of the theoretical and uh, essentially modeling physics of impact structures and basins. And of course, Oz has a significant uh, level of experience in the field in uh, Canadian craters and craters all over the world, actually, uh, as well as uh, field work in training the Canadian astronauts. So I think that's going to be hopefully a, a really illuminating discussion uh, based on the kinds of things that uh, David Kring was just pointing out. So on that note, let me remind you again that next week uh, we'll have lunar vari volcanism, the emplacement of secondary crust, uh, and um, the uh, uh, discussions again to remind you that on November 7th, the Space Directive Number One by Jim Bridenstein, the Administrator of NASA, and again on October, I'm sorry, December 19th, Future Exploration of the Moon, the Road Ahead for the Apollo 17 Lunar Module Pilot, uh, Jack Schmidt. So I want to close today by thanking Clive profusely. We really appreciate it, Clive and also thanking Ariel and Ashkan and David, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks a lot. Thank you.